let's turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, and uh, we're going to read verses uh, from verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10, to chapter 2, uh, verse 5, as we continue this uh, series, The Highway of Holiness, the uh, message of 1 Corinthians today. Uh, it is a, a very special Sunday in which, uh, with the whole nation, we remember the Queen and uh, celebrate her reign. Uh, one member of Parliament, Tim Farron, said uh, when MPs were um, paying tribute to the Queen, he said, she was a constant to us all, but, he said, as has been said already, the constant in her life was her faith in Jesus Christ. He said, let us remember this. For many people, it may be a perfunctory ceremonial faith, but for her, it was not. It was a living, active faith in a living Savior. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, the living Savior is here with us today. We're going to think more about the Queen next week, and uh, I will refer to her again as we come to the end of the sermon. Um, but we're continuing to think all the time about our living Savior and to celebrate Him. And so we turn to our Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter, 10, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, uh, reading through to chapter 2, verse 5. So Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may, might not rest on human wisdom 
but on God's power. Amen. Well, Corinth was a city in ancient Greece. I've already told my ancient Greece joke so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and that received a somewhat disappointing reaction then, so I won't tell it now um, as we think about Paul in Athens. But as I've been thinking and uh, preparing for this morning, um, an ancient Greek story has come to mind, and uh, you'll know the story, and uh, no doubt it will have been well known to the Corinthians to whom Paul wrote as well all those years ago, the story of Achilles' heel. You remember that story? Uh, the story goes that uh, uh, it was just a story, Greek mythology. When Achilles was a baby, it was foretold that he was going to die at a young age. And so his mother took him to a river that was supposed to have sort of magical qualities uh, that, that anybody bathed in this, with, uh, this river would, would, would gain its strength and become... Uh, would become invincible. So she took her baby to the, to the river and, and dipped her son into the river. Uh, the only thing was, of course, she, she held him by his heel as, as, he dipped, as she dipped him into the river. And so the water touched every other part of him, but not this part of his heel. And, uh, and the story goes that uh, later on in battle, uh, a, a poisoned arrow struck his heel at exactly the place where his mother had held him. And... Uh, and he died. And uh, the story became so well known that it has lived on into the modern world uh, in two ways. Firstly, the tendon that runs from your heel to your calf at the back of your leg is known as your Achilles tendon uh, because of that story. Uh, and secondly, of course, when we talk about someone's greatest weakness, the thing that makes them vulnerable, it, whether it's a, a physical weakness or a character trait or whatever, we often refer to it as their Achilles heel. Uh, their, their greatest point of weakness, I'm sure, uh, that you will have an Achilles heel just like that, just like I do. I wonder what your Achilles heel is. But if you prefer your stories more uh, from modern-day comics rather than ancient Greek mythology, think about Superman. He had an Achilles heel. Do you know that story? It was kryptonite, um, I, I'm told. I don't know too much about the story. Um, but Superman was supposed to be uh, invincible to anything and everything except kryptonite, a radioactive material from his home planet. It was the one thing that could bring him down. Uh, in fact, Superman even entrusted his comrade Batman with kryptonite uh, just so that Batman could use it to bring Superman down if Superman ever went rogue. Well, there's trust. And finally, if you prefer your stories less from ancient Greek mythology or modern-day comics and more from the Bible, then think about the great Samson. Uh, and uh, you can read about him in the book of Judges. He was born with great promise that he would be used by God to deliver his people to save them from their enemies. And as a symbol of his devotion to God, as a symbol of his strength coming supernaturally from God, his hair was never to be cut from the day that he was born. And as he grew up, he was able to do legendary things with his great strength. But one day he revealed that the secret of his strength was in the symbolism of his uncut hair, and that was the culmination of his downfall. So what has all of that got to do with the highway of holiness, our next steps in this journey towards uh, through, through the message of 1 Corinthians today? Well, as I say, these Corinthian Christians would have known the story of Achilles' heel, his great weakness which led to his downfall. As we've been thinking about over previous weeks, Paul planted this church in Corinth, and having planted it, his next task was then to build them up as a holy people. He wrote this letter to them, having been away for some time and having heard uh, of all sorts of problems in the life of the church. They were questioning his authority. There was incest. People were sleeping with members of their own family. They were taking each other to court. The, the sexual immorality, which was rife in surrounding culture, had found its way into the church, uh, and the Christians were behaving no differently from everyone else around them. There, was all, there were all sorts of disagreements about their beliefs. Their Sunday services were chaotic. It was a church that was filled with all sorts of problems, and yet the very first thing to which Paul turned the greatest problem of them all, the greatest weakness of the church, their greatest vulnerability was the things of which we have read today. If anything would bring down the church, it would be these issues, these problems. 
And it seems to me that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these words, preserve them in the Bible for us, because they are not only the greatest weakness for that church back then in the first century in Corinth, but the greatest weakness of the church throughout time in every place. And therefore, these will be the greatest weaknesses of Freedom Church too, our greatest vulnerability, the things that could bring us down faster than anything else. If we were to mix Greek mythology with biblical theology, not always a wise thing to do. Paul uh, will argue against that later. But, but we could say that Paul here shows the church its Achilles heel. That's the sort of language he uses. Did you notice it? The language of weakness and vulnerability and even of emptying the cross of its power. Look again at verse 17 of chapter 1 if you've got your Bible there. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. What are these two great weaknesses? We'll look at them both in turn. Uh, the first looks inwards at the unity of the church, and the second looks outward at the uniqueness of our message. There's two U's there, the unity of the church, the uniqueness of our message. Or to put it another way, we could talk about it in terms of the problems there were in Corinth. They were boasting and they were boasting about the wrong things. There wasn't unity, there was disunity, because they were boasting in their leaders. Uh, they had lost their unique message because they were boasting in their wisdom. And Paul, having described the problem, he then, well, he diagnoses the problem, and then he prescribes the antidote. It's to boast in the Lord and his cross, and we'll come to that at the end. So what wonderful things to think about this morning as a church. We're a church that has been planted and which is called by the Lord to be built up into his holy people. So firstly, the unity of the church and where it all went wrong in Corinth, boasting in their leaders. Uh, look at the, the strong words with which Paul begins. You can hear his, his desperation. Chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. He's begging them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's no greater authority uh, on which he can call, no greater reason to give them to, to do what he is asking, asking them to do. I appeal to you, I beg you in the name of the Lord Jesus that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Sounds like an almost impossible challenge, doesn't it? All of you agree with one another in what you say. No divisions among you, perfectly united in mind and thought. If you didn't know any better, you might ask, well, has he ever seen a church before? Has he ever been to a church? What's he thinking that a church could be united like this? It's a, it's a vivid image he presents. Uh, when he writes about there being no divisions, the word he uses describes a, a piece of cloth being torn apart. That's what their divisions were doing. They were being torn apart by these things. And when he writes about them being perfectly united, he uses the same word that Mark uses in his gospel when he writes about the disciples mending their nets. The fishermen were reuniting the cords that had been torn apart. Jesus had said to those disciples, and therefore to all disciples who had come after him, including us, from this time on, you will fish for people. We're supposed to be a net in the hands of the Lord. But when there's disunity, the, the net is torn apart. And the, the danger is that people will then slip through the net. How dreadful that will be. What is, after all, the, the greatest witness to the good news of Jesus in this world? Jesus later said to his disciples, By this shall everyone know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, there's not much love in disunity. The net becomes torn. People slip through it. And we continually need the Lord to be at work amongst us in the power of his Holy Spirit, mending the net, reuniting us so that we can move in the direction of perfect unity. As I say, the problem in Corinth, the thing that was causing their disunity, is that they were boasting in their leaders. And different Christians were boasting about different leaders. And someone had told all about it. Verse 11, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. That's the, the Greek name for Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. Now, the thing is that the leaders themselves weren't divided. 
Paul worked closely with Apollos. He had differences with Peter at times, but they worked them through and remained united, and yet people were using them as focal points to divide around. A and some were saying, I don't need any leader at all. It's just me and the Lord. You, you might say you follow Paul or Apollos or Peter. Well, I follow Christ. I don't need the rest of you. Well, what about Freedom Church? I mean, it's, it's James who does it for me. You know, with his baseball caps, he looks so cool. And with the, the energy and, and, and dynamism that he brings, the passion that he brings to his faith, it's James who does it for me. What about you? Some people might say, well, it's John who does it for me in Freedom Church. You know, he, he's the real deal. He, he planted, he's the one who planted Freedom Church. It wouldn't be here without him. And, and if that's not enough, he's now the, he's the national leader of, of the Free Methodist Church, the, the whole country. It's John. He's, he's the real deal. And, and who knows, there might be one or two who say, well, it's David who's got my vote. You know, someone's got to vote for him, haven't they? And uh, he tries his best, bless him. No one, really, no one really laughs at his jokes. He always uses self-deprecating humor to try to get people to like him. And, and he's, he, you know, someone's got, I always back the underdog. David's my man, you know. Or, or, or some of you might say, well, it's none of those people at Freedom Church. I love the preachers at the church of St. What's it called? St. Saint, Saint YouTube, you, you that church? Uh, or, 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 or better off. Uh, or, 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 you know, or I'm, actually, I don't want any of them at all. I'm better off without any of these leaders. It's just me and the Lord. Ageless cry. Well, what a mess Freedom Church would be in if that was the way that it was. We would be like a fishing net that is good for nothing because it's full of holes and the fish just keep swimming through. May the Lord unite us perfectly in him. As James was saying last week, one of the the overarching problems in Corinth was the, the culture of surrounding society was, was creeping into the church. Uh, and it was just that way with, with their boasting around their leaders. That's just what they did in the wider world of Corinth. The, the great philosophers, the great speakers, the great teachers would all compete to get the people to follow them. And these Christians were so used to choosing their leaders in the, in the world and boasting about the leaders that they had chosen that they were behaving that way in the church as well. Now, there may be other things that creep into the church from the wider world that give us reasons to divide today. Uh, I, th I think sometimes the divisions go something like this. Well, I'm a, a word person. It's all about the preaching. That's what's important for me. Have you heard people say that? And other people say, no, no I, well, I'm, I'm a worship person. That's, that's what, what I go to church for. Or, or I'm a spirit person, or I'm, a, I'm an evangelism person, or, or it's all about Holy Communion for me, or I'm here for the, the fellowship, or the coffee, or the comfortable chairs, or, or whatever. It's not about any of that for me, some people say. I don't need the rest of you. It's just, it's just about the Lord and me, me and the Lord. What's Paul's antidote? Well, he points them to Jesus Christ. He isn't divided. You can't divide him as if... You each have a different part of him. No, all of him is for every one of you. It was him who was crucified for you. It is because of him that you are a Christian. You were baptized into his name. It's about Jesus, says Paul. Not the leader who happened to bring you to faith or baptize you or who teaches you or whatever. It's all about Jesus. You see how disunity is the dreadful Achilles heel of the church, our greatest weakness which risks losing our power. Paul concludes his great appeal in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. It is possible for the cross of Christ to be emptied of its power, to have, to have no effect for you whatsoever. And, and one of the surest ways to do that is to bring disunity in the church. If we are a disunited church, then we will empty the cross of its power in our ministry. If Freedom Church is not united, then do not be surprised if our proclamation of the good news is powerless and ineffective. When the Holy Spirit fell and brought revival to East Africa about 100 years ago, one of the first things he did was to sort out the disunity of the Christians there, and particularly the disunity between the Europeans on the one hand and the Africans on the other. 
and, and there really had been dreadful disunity. It took a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit to resolve it all, but it really did result in unity that, that most wouldn't have believed was possible. Uh, perhaps they came close to being perfectly united, uh, as Paul calls for here. That was an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit, and we should pray for that, but we should also pursue unity in any and every ordinary way possible. It, it seems to me that that you will be exerting pressure on the net one way or another. So that either pulling it apart so that it is in risk of tearing or pulling it together so that it can be knitted together in unity. Uh, we could say potentially that everything we do and everything we don't do within the life of the church either pulls it together or pulls it apart. How are you exerting pressure within the life of this church? So the Holy Spirit makes his appeal to us too. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you can be perfectly united in mind and thought. Are you excited about the highway of holiness? Were you excited? This is where it begins. It might not sound terribly exciting. It begins with the people around you. And whether you're pulling yourself towards them or pulling yourself away from them. And the people that you're careful not to sit anywhere near begins with them too. Remember the great psalm of unity, Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. If we long to see the Lord bestowing his blessing on us here in Kingswood and everywhere else where we are, if we long to see the Lord pouring out the anointing of his Holy Spirit upon us, then we must strive towards a unity that is unlike any unity you have ever seen before. That was their first problem, boasting in their leaders. The first issue Paul addressed, the unity of the church. And secondly, they were boasting in their wisdom. So Paul turns to write of the uniqueness of their message. Uh, he has just written of the danger of emptying the cross of its power, uh, and now he adds something else uh, about the cross. Uh, there are two possible responses to this message of the cross. Verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. As we'll see later, and uh, as I'm sure we will see throughout this series in the Highway of Holiness, the root of the problems in the church at Corinth was the fact that they had misunderstood the message of the cross. And here is one of the key ways in which they had misunderstood it. They had forgotten the uniqueness of the message and were instead boasting in their wisdom. What are the two ways in which to respond to the message of the cross? One is to see it as foolishness and therefore to empty it, to empty it of its power so that it will have no effect in your life. You will continue to perish, says Paul. And the other is to become a recipient of its power and to be saved to us who are being saved Says Paul, it is the power of God. The world dismisses it as foolishness. How foolish you are, they say to us, to believe that there is a God we can know who steps into this world and makes himself known to us and, uh, and dies for us on a cross so that we can be forgiven of the guilt that we carry and rose again. I mean, who ever heard of something so foolish as that and promises that we'll go to heaven when we die? They dismiss it all as foolishness. But to, to those who are being saved, says Paul, it is the power of God. Interesting phrase, isn't it? Those who are being saved. We sometimes talk about the Lord saved me. Let me tell you about how the Lord saved me in the past tense. But Paul talks about it here in the present tense. Um, I, I saw somebody wrote uh, quite recently that... Uh, they said, as soon as my grandfather saw the Titanic, he knew it was going to sink. And, and he tried to warn everybody. He said, it's going to sink, it's going to sink. But nobody listened to him. Everybody ignored him. And it, but he kept on persisting. It's going to sink, it's going to sink. And he said, in the end, they got so fed up with it that they threw him out of the cinema. Um, I'll just pause for the laughter. Um, why did I tell that? Oh, yes, it's about a sinking ship. You see, you could, you could step off the... The, the ship onto the lifeboat and, and say, I have been saved. 
And as the lifeboat is carrying you across the sea, you could look back at the ship as it goes down and, and you could say, I, I'm being saved. And look towards the, the, the horizon and the land that is approaching and, and say in faith, I will be saved. And, and it's the same with us as Christians. Uh, that's what the cross does in our lives. As soon as we run to the cross and, and, and cling to the cross, we can say, I have been saved. And as we journey through this life and, and, and God works in our lives through the power of the cross, we can say, I am being saved. And we can look to the future with glorious hope and say, I will be saved. To those who are being saved, the cross is, is the power of God. The Christians in Corinth were boasting in their wisdom and just, just like everybody else in the world around them. And so they were in danger of making the cross out to be foolishness. They were emptying the cross of its power. And, and yet the only reason the church in Corinth existed was because the, the cross had been at the heart of the message that Paul had preached there. Uh, we're going to hear about this as we come to 1 Corinthians 15 later in this series. Now, brothers and sisters, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to it. For what I received I passed on to you, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he, he, raised, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and, and that he appeared to Cephas. Time and time again throughout Paul's ministry, the message proved to be a stumbling block and was dismissed as foolishness. Jews demand signs, he says, and Greeks look for wisdom. In the synagogues, they dismissed the crucifixion as foolishness. They wouldn't entertain the idea of the resurrection. They were looking for greater and greater signs, and yet they dismissed the greatest sign of all, that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Greeks paraded their wisdom or looked for some special secret, and yet, yet they missed it all. They, they tried to climb up the ladder of their own wisdom and intelligence to reach God, and yet they would find that the ladder would never go high enough. We become prideful, and, and we dismiss as foolishness the very, the very idea of God become man and dying on a cross. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the paradox of the way that God works in the, in the world, working through the cross, was shown even in who these Christians in Corinth were uh, brothers and sisters, verse 26, he says, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Throughout many periods of the church's history in times past, one of the greatest criticisms of the church, one of the greatest objections to the gospel, one of the greatest reasons for rejecting it all, has been that the church welcomes and includes people from even the so-called lowest ranks of society. Uh, in John Wesley's day, the Duchess of Buckingham was very critical of the message that John Wesley and his companions preached. And so she wrote a letter to the Countess of Huntingdon, who was a supporter of Wesley and uh, his friends, and she said their doctrines are most repulsive, impertinent, disrespectful, she says, it is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth that is highly offensive and insulting. The Countess of Huntington, who was a follower of the Lord, wrote back and she said that she was thankful for the M in many in Paul's letter here. Not many of you were of noble birth because without the M, it would have said not any of you were of noble birth, and therefore there would have been no place for her because she was of noble birth. But she found level ground at the foot of the cross that welcomes all. We come on the same terms. We bow down low, and as a gift, we humbly accept the salvation, the forgiveness, the freedom from guilt that the Lord offers to all. Uh, let's move on into the last thing very quickly. Uh, Paul has written of the unity of the church, that the problem uh, was they were boasting in the leaders. He's written of the uniqueness of their message. The problem was that they were boasting in their wisdom. And now he writes of the antidote. Uh, I couldn't think of a U for that. Um, but it's still about boasting. Boasting in the Lord and his cross. Uh, verse uh, 31. 
Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul could have um, behaved in the same way as, uh, as these Corinthians when he went to Corinth. He was a, a well-educated man amongst the best educated of his, of his generation. He was a great debater. He was full of worldly wisdom. He could have beaten anybody in a debate. But had he have done that, his message wouldn't have had any power at all. Because he knew that the power of God is only made manifest in the cross and in its proclamation. Chapter 2, verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And, and so he says, verse 1, chapter 2, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Just picture the scene by all accounts. There is a historical account outside of the Bible. Paul was was not much to look at. He wasn't very tall. He wasn't very good looking. Uh, he had been severely beaten in places just before he came here. He had been imprisoned. He had been secretly transported at night. He had been rejected. He was on his own. His, his companions had been left behind. Uh, and so he says, verse 3, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. And yet before he arrived, he had already made his decision. I resolved, verse 2, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was the only sure foundation for their faith. If he had used human wisdom, that would have been the basis of their faith. And it would have fallen short as soon as they reached the limits of their wisdom. If he had used magic tricks and great signs, that would have been the basis of their faith. And when the, 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 the signs stopped, so would their faith. So one preacher has said, if you put a circus on to bring people to church, you will have to keep up the circus to, to keep them coming. If we dazzle people with glorious promises, and they come to faith. As soon as life starts going badly, the faith flees. Not for Paul. Verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Only the cross can put you on the highway of holiness. And only the cross can keep you on the highway of holiness. They talk of the East Africa, East Africa revival again. The highway of holiness was one of their key images, one of their key messages, the key picture of, of the Christian life that God calls us to, the, the highway of holiness. They said the door onto the highway of holiness goes through the cross, and it's a low door. You must bow down low and go through on your knees in repentance and faith. And, and we might often slip off the highway of holiness, but all is not lost. There, there is a way back. But it's the way at which, in which we came at first. That low door through the cross, humbly coming on our knees in repentance and faith to walk again as the Lord calls us to walk. What about your faith? Have you ever been lost in life when you've been on a journey? The, the men probably won't want to admit to it, but they know deep down that, that even if nobody else has spotted it, they were lost at times. Have you ever been lost? I got lost last night, actually. I was, talking, I was walking back from a shop, uh, talking to Mike on my phone, and I wasn't concentrating on where I was going, and I ended up 15 minutes away from where I should have been. And I thought, why has this happened? And then I thought, ah, it's a sermon illustration for tomorrow. Have you ever been lost? You see, if we can't even manage to find our way back from the corner shop to home, how are we going to find our way to heaven? The good news is it doesn't depend on my ability at all. It doesn't depend on your wisdom and working it out for yourself. It doesn't even depend on you living a holy life because you won't be able to. It depends on him, on Jesus Christ, on all he has done for you. It depends on the power of God shown in the cross. It's level ground. And there's always a way back through that very same cross. We have an Achilles heel in the church. It is the unity of the church. The problem was that they were boasting in their leaders. Let that never be a problem here. 
their, their, it, their Achilles heel was also in the uniqueness of their message. They had lost the uniqueness of their message because they were boasting in their wisdom. May that never be a problem here. The antidote is boasting in the Lord and in his cross. And then in his power, we will be truly invincible. Can you find a place for this Lord, this Savior in your heart? And can you find a place in your heart for your brothers and sisters in Christ, even though they might be very annoying at times, even though they might be wrong at, the t at times and not see why you're so right? Can you find a place in your heart for them? That's the call of, of the Holy Spirit to us today. I, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, that you should be perfectly united. I promised that uh, I would return to the Queen at the end of the service. When she died last week, um, and, and it was said with deliberate uh, hyperbole, um, that in her passing, the Church of England had lost its greatest evangelist. Uh, they, they meant that, of course, uh, every Christmas, once a year, that the Queen clearly spoke to, to millions and millions and millions of people around the world of her faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, on her Christmas Day message in, in 2011, this is what she said after speaking about her family. Uh, for many, she said, this Christmas will not be easy with our armed forces deployed around the world. Thousands of service families face Christmas without their loved ones at home. The bereaved and the lonely will find it especially hard. And as we all know, the world is going through difficult times. All this will affect our celebration of this great Christian festival. Finding hope in adversity is one of the themes of Christmas. Jesus was born into a world full of fear. The angels came to frighten shepherds with hope in their voices. Fear not, they said. We bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He went on, although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches that we sometimes need saving from ourselves from our recklessness or our greed, God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a savior with the power to forgive. Forgiveness lies at the heart of the Christian faith. It can heal broken families. It can restore friendships. It can reconcile divided communities. It is in forgiveness that we feel the power of God's love. In the last verse of this beautiful carol, he said, O little town of Bethlehem, there's a prayer. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. And she concluded, and here we will conclude today too. It is my prayer, she said, on this Christmas day, that we might all find room in our lives for the message of the angels and for the love of God through Christ our Lord. Amen.